Hello, I'm Peter Kapitein. Uh, I'm a patient advocate at Inspire to Live. Inspire to Live is a global patient advocacy organization. We connect um, all stakeholders in the medical industrial complex, which means patients, organizations, researchers, physicians, people working in industry, regulators, payers. Um, and our aim is to connect them and find solutions that improve quality of life for cancer patients. That is in short our organization. Today I'm going to talk about data, uh, the possibilities uh, and the power of uh, data, artificial intelligence and the impact on regulation on this, this topic. Let me start with a small anecdote. Um, the first time I talked about data was in Toronto 2011 in front of an audience of researchers and people working in industry. And um, um, as a patient advocate, I emphasized the need for using the data of the patients. And I also said, I think you should use my data because I'm a lymphoma patient and there is a lot of data of me available in research institute, hospitals, etc. After that talk that I gave in Toronto, the organizer, Stephen Friend, said to me, Peter, I think you should call your talk, that's my data. And that's important to know, that's my data. We're talking about patients, but we're also talking about the data of patients. In that audience, I also emphasized that data is not about the data. It's not about the data, it's not about research, it's not about treatments, it's about quality of life of patients. And for that, you need data, you need research, you need treatments you, that in the end will lead when we all do a good job to a better quality of life for cancer patients. By the way, the same counts, of course, for other serious diseases. Now, the question is, who owns the data? If I talk about that's my data, I say, hey, that is my data as a patient. I'm a patient here in the Netherlands, it's the Amsterdam Medical Center. There is a lot of data of me in that center. That is my data. But always be aware there is also a lot of data of patients in industry. Now, then we have to deal with two aspects of owning the data. We have the legal aspect. That's quite tricky. The data in the hospitals is owned by patients. But I think physicians and researchers will think a little differently on that. The data in the databases of industry are legally not owned by patients. So I add a second element to that legal aspect, and that is ethical. From an ethical perspective, I think we need, we ought to think differently. And that is because of an take into account the data, research, treatments, and quality of life flow. We need that data for better quality of life. Now, looking at patients, quite a few surveys have been done about data and be the use of data for by researchers and people in industry. Almost all patients want to share their data. If you do a survey on the, among, among citizens, that's a little differently. Citizens is approximately 60% that want to share their data, but also a majority. The difference between patients and citizens is, in my opinion, urgency. Patients feel an urgency to do something about their disease or to contribute to a solution that benefits patients that come after them. So the conclusion of quite some research is that patients want to share their data. So the statement of me in the talk in Toronto, that's my data, can also be added with use my data. It's my data, use my data. So when that data would become more available for research, we can produce better treatments, we can improve quality of life. So what would happen when we put all the data 
let's dream a little bit. We put all the data open source, open access. Now, that's of course not the situation. Why? Why are we not sharing the data? Looking at scientists, looking at the researcher, they want to keep the data for themselves, or at least till the moment of uh, of publishing. Then I have to pub then they have to 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 uh, share the data. Then they have to open up the data, to show what they did with the data, how they use the data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They suffer a little bit from the parish, uh, publish or parish culture, the the, the 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 culture that scientists live in, that they have to publish. Um, uh, and that's a one reason. Industry have more commercial reasons not to share. Um, in the end, when they um, want to register new medicines at, for example, EMA or FDA, they have to contribute, they have to put their data uh, uh, in, at EMA or FDA, but it's not published, it's not open, it's not available for uh, researchers. So there are two reasons known why we do not share. And always keep in mind when we not share, and I will come back to that later, we slow down the process of progress. I think there is another one that is at least as important as the reason why scientists and industry do not share or do not share quickly enough, and that's privacy. The whole issue of privacy and regulation on data prevents us from speeding up the process using the data by sharing it among researchers and in industry. And think of that, what happened 5, 10, 15 years ago when privacy became more and more and more important. What we see now is that privacy is discussed and worked on by regulators, all legal personnel. In my opinion, privacy has become a profession instead of a human topic. Lawyers are discussing the privacy regulation, whether it's HIPAA, whether it's GDPR, whether it's the AI Act. Lawyers are discussing it and they do not have in mind the people that need the data to do their work in research industry to improve and implement treatments. That is not bad intention. A lot of people think of criminal pharma or bad doctors or, 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 or bad scientists. That's not the issue. I don't believe in bad in intention. Every now and then there will be someone in industry or in research that doesn't have good intentions, but that's an exception. It's a simple solution to say, hey, it's criminal pharma or bad doctors as the cause of not sharing. But I think the problem is more complex. It's simply the way we work. It's how we wake up in the morning, work together with our colleagues, with our community, and then the, the pressure of the group or the habits that we all have determine how we work. But what happens if you do that for a long time is what I call distraction. It's the distraction from the essence of your work. The essence of the work in healthcare should be improving quality of life for patients. I'm always talking about cancer patients, but the same, the same uh, uh, counts for rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, or other serious diseases. So if you distract from the essence of your work things like making privacy more and more important and lose sight upon the consequences. The consequences of distraction are what is called the hidden costs of saying no. A in other words, when you say you cannot use this data because then you violate privacy and you only think about privacy 
and not about the consequences, then you do not make a good judgment on costs and benefits. It's an old statement. It's a wonderful article, The Hidden Costs of Saying No, written in 1975 by Freeman Dyson, who worked almost his whole life in the Institute of Advanced Studies. But the hidden costs of saying no are so important and have such enormous consequences that the focus on privacy made me think of the hidden cost of compliancy. What are the hidden costs of compliancy to, like I said, whether it's GDPR, HIPAA, AI Act, what are the hidden costs when we are only working in our own community as legal personnel and not work together with other people in the medical industrial complex, not work with patients and patient advocates? A colleague of mine made once a beautiful statement, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I think that is something to keep in mind. It's easy to talk about a topic when the one who has the burden to take or has to take the risks of that work is not at the table. Let me give another example. Who is making most profit in healthcare? Financial institutions, banks. After that, the pharmaceutical industry, medical equipment industry, then the board of hospitals, then the doctors, then the nurses. So the closest you work with patients, the less profit you make. Banks are way, way off patients. So the decisions to take are quite easy, whether the consequences for the patients are good or bad. It's always distraction to keep in mind. So the hidden cost of compliancy means that when we are not dealing with patients at our table, can be enormously. Not having the patients at the table, not working together with patients and patient aspects, does not mean that you're not responsible for the outcome. If we, and I emphasize we, if we delay the introduction of a new treatment that costs the life of 100,000 people, that still makes us responsible for the death of 100,000 people. That's a quote of a philosopher called Jonathan Savolescu. But the word responsible in that is of importance. We are responsible when we delay the implementation of a treatment. One can, one can count the number of patients in cancer that will die or will live shorter than they have to when we delay a treatment. So not making available data for research, etc., doesn't take away the responsibility of us. And listen quite carefully to what I say. I speak about we and us. So I also speak about patients and patient advocate having a responsibility for sharing. We, patient advocates, have to say, it's my data, use my data. So I've spoken about the hidden cost of compliancy. When patients are not at the table, they're on the menu. Now, what can we do and what should we do? I think trust in the use of data by researchers or industry is very important. Now, let me give you an example uh, of a profession that I was in for many years, financial industry, banks. When I ask, do you trust banks? Most people start laughing and say, no, I do not trust banks. Okay, the next question is, where is your money? It's at the bank. 
So your money is at an institution that you do not trust. I think you do trust them because what we all accomplished, what we accomplished are the right checks and balances that when something happens with your money, a bank goes bankrupt, the checks and balances are in place. You know, at least in the Western world, that when you have 50,000 euros, an amount of money up to 100,000 euro on the bank, the bank goes bankrupt, you get back your money. So the checks and balances are in place. I think speaking about privacy as maybe the biggest hurdle that we need to take for the use of data, speaking of privacy, most checks and balances are in place. When a researcher is not using the data in a proper way, you could say, put it a little blunt, his career is down the drain. First, there is the process of peer review, but even when he passes peer reviews and it's not used in the right way, in the end, it will become known. And you have to correct yourself. And if abuse has been proven, then your career is down the drain. I think in industry, the checks and balances can be improved. There are checks and balances, but it can be improved so that also when industry uses the data for their work and be aware we need industry to work with data, do research and implement new treatments. The simple fact that I'm alive is because of the good work of industry. So don't focus on the bad things they do, but focus on the good things they do. I think the checks and balances in industry can be improved. I'm a big fan, not because of the Congress that I'm now speaking for, but I'm a big fan for decades for open source and open access. But when dealing with the data of industry and open source of access, also put the data about the failures on the medicines of industry in open access and open source. I've spoken about responsibility. I think we need to take our responsibility in a much better way than we did so far. Always be aware of the consequences of your work and the consequences of your decisions as a patient, but also as a researcher, as a people working in industry, very important. And I think maybe the, 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 well, maybe not the most important thing we need to do, but it starts with patients and patient advocates that make it our problem. It is our problem, the use of data, the privacy regulation, it is our problem that we're dealing with. I have a lymphoma and I needed my physician badly. I needed the medicines of industry badly. I needed excellent research badly, but it still was my problem. So when the flow of data, research, treatments and quality of life, the quality of life and is the most important and is what we are working for, we have to realize as a patient advocate that it, we're dealing with our problem. As long as we do not make it our problem, it will not be solved or it will take a long time. So when we make it our problem, we have to put the right people in the room. The right people means people with an open mind, people who are willing to put their interest on the table and say, hey, this is what I'm in for. The interest of industry is different from patients. That's not a bad thing. That's quite logical. So if industry, no, no, we're here at the table for patients, nonsense. I'm at the table for patients. Industry is at the table for shareholders. And the way to do the work for shareholders, as the shareholders will, is to improve quality of life of patients. But my primary interest is patients and the, 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 the industry primary, industry primary interest is the shareholders. The researchers primary interest is to do good research and publish and get a good career or whatsoever. We all contribute in the end to quality of life. But if you 
put the right people in the room, put the right people at the table. I think the we and the responsibility that we have to take will improve. And when you're in that room, you all realize that openness is the key word for speeding up the whole process. So that's my message for this Congress. And I hope you have a wonderful time and I hope that you can contribute. Thank you. <laughs>